Parshas Vayechi uh, brings the Book of Gracious to a close. So before we begin talking about the Parsha, let's just talk about the idea of Sefer Gracious as opposed to Sefer Shemot and all the other Chumashim. And uh, I think we've talked about this in the past, but it always bears repeating. What is the idea of the division of the Chumash into five Svarim? Is it just a matter of convenience? It would be very heavy to lug around. And so uh, therefore we divide it into five volumes. It's only in a printed uh, Chumash. It's in five volumes. And it's Hefer Torah. It's still one scroll. So what is the idea of dividing it into five distinct books? The idea is that each book has a unifying theme. And when the theme is completed, the book is completed, and we go on to the next book. So it's not one single story, so to speak, that begins with the Beis of Horatius and ends with the Lamed, Olayne Kal Yisrael. Each of the books has a, a theme. The Ramban says that the theme of Sefer Horatius is <coughs> Yitzira, formation. <coughs> Sefer Bracious is the Sefer Yitzira, the Book of Formation. Sefer Shemos is the Sefer Agu'ula, is the Book of Redemption. Now each of those uh, statements requires understanding because Yitzira, creation, is really only the beginning of Sefer Bracious, you know, the first the chapter. Because after that, the creation is complete. And Gu'ula, redemption, only is the uh, first several parshias of Sefer Shemos. After that, the subject of redemption is complete. So in what sense is Sefer Bracious, the Sefer of Yitzira, and Sefer Shemos, Sefer of Ula? So the Ramban explains each of those propositions. Number one, Yitzira doesn't only mean formation of the physical world. Yitzira means the formation of the Jewish nation. Sefer Gracious is the Sefer of the Yitzira, the formation of the Jewish nation. How so? I mean, it's the early history of the Jewish nation. How is it the formation? So the Ramban here lays down the uh, fundamental principle which guides his entire commentary to Sefer Gracious, which is the idea of Maisa Ovais Sibn Labonim. That which transpires in the lives of the Ovais is a sign, it's an omen, it foreshadows that which will happen in the lives of the children. And the Ramban understands that this isn't a mere coincidence. Like it's an amazing thing. So many things happen to the forefathers that are replicated in the lives of their descendants. The Ramban understands this is the very process through which God guides the course of history. When God wants something to happen in later Jewish history, he brings it about in the lives of the Avais, and in a way, this lays the groundwork for the future events. That's his system of organizing and manipulating the course of history. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants there to be a Tzias Mitzrayim, there should be an exodus. HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings about certain similar events in the life of Ram Avinu. Ram Avinu goes down to Mitzrayim, there's a famine. <coughs> uh, his wife is abducted. Paro is smitten with plagues. Avram leaves with great wealth. This exactly corresponds to the story which happens on the national level in the Sefer Shemot. So therefore, Sefer Gracious is the Yitzhiva, it's the actual formation. In the Misa of a Simon Lubanim, in the ways in which Akadosh Baruch Hu brings historic events around the first time, that actually forms the future path of history. And that's the sense in which Sefer Bracious is a Yitzir. It's the formation of the Jewish nation because all the historical events that will ultimately follow all happened the first time around in Sefer Bracious. And we've talked about that many times. There are many, many stories in Sefer Bracious and what they correspond to in later Jewish history. That's the <coughs> Ramban's fundamental understanding of the sense in which Bracious is the Sefer Yitzir. <coughs> Now, the Ramban also understands that the lives of the Ovas were the pinnacle of achievement. 
And it's important for us to understand that, uh, that we live in a time where the dominant paradigm is evolution and progress. Because we are getting better, we are getting smarter, more sophisticated, more advanced, and so on and so forth. <coughs> the fact that so many people believe this is a mystery. <coughs> because in so many ways, it is clear that society is in a process of degeneration. You know, if you look at the last 50 years, you have to ask yourself, like, in what ways have we in North America advanced? Besides, in the technological sense, how have we advanced as a society? Are we more ethical? Are we more <laughs> moral? Are we more understanding? It's, it's almost hard to find any area except one that comes to mind, maybe two that come to mind. I think in the area of civil rights, maybe, one can make the argument that society has advanced. But in terms of morality, in virtually every other area, it seems we're in a process of decline. Because even when uh, government officials point with great pride to reduced crime rates, that isn't a sign of improved morality among the people. That's a uh, sign of uh, improved police work. <laughs> you know, uh, greater crime prevention. You know, the fact that people don't leave their houses unlocked anymore and uh, that they have bars on the windows and so on and so forth. It's not because all of a sudden people have become so uh, ethically uh, sensitive. And uh, of course, if you just watch and uh, carefully study popular culture and mass media, as you see that once, what once upon a time, not long ago, could not be shown um, publicly to anybody, and nowadays can be shown to children. And so it's hard to think of any area where we've really advanced morally. Yet, people seem to think that we are getting better, we are becoming uh, more noble, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, I'll just mention this thing because it is a uh, something that we've become desensitized to, which is that, uh, you know, we live in a society where the great moral crusade is to perpetrate a holocaust against the unborn. You know, hundreds and thousands of abortions take place in North America a year. And uh, as I pointed out many times, that every uh, moral crime, first, is a crime against language. It was when killing of fetuses becomes uh, euphemistically referred to as uh, women's reproductive health. Now, this is what follows. And I've mentioned many times the desire the Zayar and Parsha Shemais that says that the great merit, the great merit of the Bnei Yisrael in Mitzrayim, for which they were redeemed, is that no one ever aborted a fetus in Mitzrayim. That's what the Zayar says. Despite the fact that they were a slave nation and they should have had compassion on children being born into servitude, yet no one dreamt of such an idea, such a horrible thing to abort a fetus. That was the schus, that was the merit for which our forefathers were taken out of Mitzrayim. And uh, now it's become a moral imperative to guarantee women's reproductive health, that we have to uh, allow this and give it uh, constitutional protection, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's the, the, the idea that anyone can make a claim of moral superiority is just, uh, to me, something which is astounding. But that's the down paradigm. We as Jews do not think this way. We do not think this way. Now, there's a concept of Yeridas Hadoros, the descent of generations. Now, there's a famous statement the Gemara says, If the earlier generations were like angels, we are like people. If the earlier generations are like people, we're like donkeys. In other words, it's, it's all relative, you know. If you want to see yourself as a person, then look at 
your forebears as angels. If you want to look at your forebears as being near people, then you see yourself as a donkey. But to equate yourself to them is impossible. That's the concept of Yerida Sodoris. But it's important to understand that this idea of Yerida Sodoris is in two different areas. First, number one, it is in clarity and Torah knowledge. In clarity of Torah knowledge. And that, of course, is uh, very easy to understand. Because our Torah knowledge comes from a moment of revelation. God gave the Torah to Moshe in its entirety, Torah Shabbat, Torah Shabbat, the written law, the oral law. And uh, from that time onward, we've been playing again, broken telephone. We've been transmitting the Messiah, and as we know, in any process of transmission, there's a loss of clarity, a loss of information. So naturally, there's going to be a decline with the passage of time. As we can demonstrate that here in the room, I'll start with a message, and I'll whisper it to one person, everybody whispers it to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. By the time it reaches the last person, probably the message will become corrupted. So if you're talking about a chain of transmission which spans generations, naturally there'll be some loss of information. And that's certainly true. That one of the areas of Yerida Sadoras, one of the areas of descent, is in Torah knowledge, Torah scholarship, Torah clarity. But it's more than that. It's also in terms of spirituality, in terms of connection to God. There's also no decline. Chazal <laughs> tell us that Ha'avais Hain Hain Hamerkava, the forefathers of Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov, they were the divine chariot, meaning the Shechina rested upon their tents. That the the pinnacle of spirituality that a human being can attain was achieved by Avraham Yitzchak and Yaakov. And from that point, a process of descent began. And that's what really our Parsha marks. Our Parsha, Parsha Zavayichi, marks the beginning of that process. With the passing of Yaakov and the generation of Mitzrayim, next week's Parsha carries the theme forward. There is a process of decline. <coughs> to the extent that the Jews of Mitzrayim fall into areas of sin, according to Chazal, which, which defy understanding. To the extent that at the splitting of the Red Sea, when God performed the miracles to save the Jews from the Egyptians, the angels couldn't understand why God is taking sides. He's, they, they say, These are idolaters, and these are idolaters. You're drowning these to save those. Where's the, where's the justice? It's not fair. That means that to the casual observer, to the Malach, the Jews and the Egyptians were indistinguishable. It looked like God was taking sides totally in an arbitrary way. And the Chazal tell us that one of the things that the Jews gave up in Mitzrayim was bris mila, was circumcision. It was only the night before they left Egypt. They had to eat the carbon Pesach, required the Jews be circumcised. Then the circumcision was performed. But all the years in Mitzrayim, the covenant with God was abandoned. Except for Shevet Levi. Shavit Levi says briskha and so they guarded the covenant, they observed brismila in Mitzrayim. So we're talking about a, a genuine decline. Just we've pointed out many times, if you haven't heard this, you've never come to this class, but we've pointed out many times that when Chazal say that uh, the Jews in Egypt were redeemed in the merit of uh, keeping their Jewish names and the Jewish language and Jewish clothing, don't make a mistake about that. It doesn't mean they were so perfect that down to the last detail they kept their Jewishness. It means the exact opposite. It means that really, in terms of the genuine content of their Jewishness, they lost virtually everything. They still had the trappings of Jewish ethnicity. They had Jewish names, and they spoke Hebrew, when they wore Jewish clothing, whatever Jewish clothing is, I don't know what, exactly what that would mean. They wore Jewish clothing. So they, they, they had the trappings of Jewish ethnicity. But in terms of genuine content of spirituality and religious observance, they gave it all up. This was enough to be redeemed. Why? Because God made a covenant with the Jewish people. And God said to them, listen, that, uh, I have a promise, I have a commitment. If the Jewish people are recognizable as an entity, then the covenant is operative. If the Jewish people assimilate out of existence, then there's no party to the covenant. So on that, Chazal say, in what way were they Jewish? Rismila, they didn't have. 
Monotheism, they didn't have. So in what way would they recognize and be Jewish? Why was the covenant operative? Ah, because they still had Jewish names. They still wore Jewish clothing. They still spoke Hebrew. So they were recognized and be Jewish. And uh, that's why it's very important that we not dismiss this. Because a Jew who eats gefilte fish is a Jew who can be reached. A Jew who eats gefilte fish, even lax, is a Jew that can be reached. When the Jew gives up gefilte fish for sushi, they are one step farther removed. That's why eating Jewish food is a very, very important thing. It's a very important thing. It's not the biggest mitzvah in the Torah. But in terms of maintaining an identification with the Jewish people, it's an important thing. It's an important. It's not to be belittled. Not to be belittled. But in any case, there was a process of generation. And of course, that process was reversed with the exodus from Egypt. And it was reversed in a fantastic way that the Jews in a very short time, they were redeemed from Egypt, and they prepared themselves spiritually, and they received the Torah at our Sinai, and the Shekhinah ultimately descended upon the Mishkan that they had built, and then at that moment they were truly restored to the level of the forefathers. And says the Ramban, and that is when the process of Gu'ula is complete. Gu'ula does not mean political freedom, liberation from bondage. Gula is restoration to one's original status. So the Jews were only restored to their original status when they were redeemed from Egypt, when they received the Torah, when the Mishkan was built and the Divine Presence came to rest on it. That is when they were restored to the level of the Avos, which were the Merkava, the Divine Chariot. And that's why Sefer Shemos is the Sefer Ha Gula. The other Sfarim will cover when we, we get to them. But Sefer, Sefer Boratius is really the Sefer of formation. And therefore, when we think about it for a second, that the experience of the Avais and the experience of the Banim can be very, very different at the very same time. Meaning, let's say you have Yaakov and Yosef, and there is a 17-year overlap at the beginning of Pasha's Vayachi. And you would think that they are experiencing somewhat of the same thing. They're enjoying each other's company, it's a very happy time, and so on and so forth. Not necessarily so. Because what Yaakov is experiencing is he is laying the groundwork for some event which is far, far, far into the future. And Yosef is living in the here and now. And therefore their experiences, as we will see, can be very, very different. The experiences of Yaakov and his children. Because as an Av, my service in the bottom. His life, his experiences at that time are really significant in terms of what they represent in the future course of Jewish history. And the experiences of Yosef and the brothers are significant because this is actually the history, the sim in the bottom. This is what is unfolding now. Let me illustrate this point. Come to Parshas Vayachi. And uh, Rashi makes a famous observation that this parsha <coughs> is stuma. This parsha is a closed parsha. You know, in the Sefer Torah, there are spaces between paragraphs. Spaces between paragraphs. Those are called parshios. The, actually, I should say that the paragraphs are called parshios, and there are spaces between the parshios. And normally, every weekly portion stops at such a place. Well, that's a logical place for a weekly portion to end at one of the spaces. Parsha's Vayechi does not end in a space. The first word of Vayechi is a continuation of the paragraph, which is the last paragraph of Vayigash. So something which is very unusual. The Loma Parsha Zustuma. 
Why is this parsha closed? Meaning, whoever ordained the division of the chapters, the division of the weekly portions, why did he ordain that Parshas Vayechi should end, or should begin rather, just at this point? Because why didn't he um, have the Parsha begin uh, five seconds later? At Vayehi Achrei Ad Varm Wouldn't you call Parshas Vayechi? Would you call Parshas Vayehi? And uh, that Parsha begins at a space. So uh, Rashi says no. Rashi says because this is the beginning of the of the Golos. This is the beginning of the Egyptian exile. This is the beginning of the Egyptian exile. Now Rashi makes the point that it was when Yaakovinu died. When Yaakovinu died. When Yaakovinu died, the eyes and the hearts of the Jewish people began to close Mitzara Sashibut. But the truth is, the Medrash, which is the source of Rashi, does not say that it was when Yaakov Vinu died. And if it was when Yaakov Vinu died, it would be very odd that the closed parish should be just at this point. At this point, Yaakov is very much alive for another couple chapters. But the Medrash, which is the source of Rashi, seems to say that this closing of the heart, the closing of the eyes, the, the darkness, the cloud descending, really began when Yaakov was very much alive. Because they, they knew it was imminent. They knew that it was, it was coming. It wasn't only when Yaakov died. Even in Yaakov's lifetime, they knew the, the blackness, the darkness, the, the imminence of the Egyptian exile. Yet, interestingly, it says, Vayechi Yaakov Beretz Mitzrayim. The Yaakov lived in Eretz Mitzrayim. And the, uh, the Arachayim says in his commentary, really based on Midrashim, that the emphasis is on the lived. He lived. These were the best years of his life. These 17 years that he was reunited with Yosef were the best years of his life. I'll just mention something as an aside, totally unrelated, but it's something that is good to know. For those of us who have raised children, the Medrash points out an amazing thing, that how many years did Yaakov raise Yosef until they were separated? 17 years. And how many years did Yosef take care of Yaakov? 17 years. So it's measure for measure. There's a payback. If you raise your children, your children will take care of you. That is very, very consoling. Again, for those of us who have raised children and are looking forward to old age, that <coughs> our children may pay us back. But just I want you to know, my father, Zechayim Lavracha, used to always say something. And I ultimately found that the Shalah HaKadosh says it in this week's parasha. My father used to say, or was apparently a popular saying, says that one father can support ten children, but ten children can't support one father. <laughs> well, my father used to say it all the time. But the Shalal Kaddish actually says that in this week's parasha. Now, the reason might be because the ten children are in turn each supporting their own ten children, so maybe that's why they can't do it. But the truth is that the payback usually doesn't come. But in this case of Yaakov, it did come. And for the 17 years that Yaakov raised Yosef, Yosef in turn supported Yaakov. But these were the best years of his life. These are the best years of his life. So these years, it's, it's very odd. On the one hand, they are for Yaakov, wonderfully enriching, happy years. He's reunited with his son. It's, it's wonderful. The best years of his life. He had a hard life, but these are the best years of his life. And on the other hand, for the sons, this is a time of encroaching darkness. Because they see that the exile is imminent. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And that's not a contradiction. Because again, the Bonium, the children are living in the here and now. And obviously, this is the beginning of the exile. This is the beginning of the Egyptian experience. And therefore, they see the darkness. They see the, the persecution. They see the torment. They see all the difficulties that are coming. And that's why, to them, this is a time of great fear and great uh, worry, great concern. Yaakov Avinu sees beyond it. 
because he is living through the end of Jewish history. Because remember, if Maisa of a Simon Lubanim, so the end of Yaakov's life corresponds to the end of Jewish history. The end of Jewish history is the Masa Mashiach. The end of Jewish history is the most glorious time. So these 17 years, these last 17 years of Yaakov's life correspond in his life, in the sense of Maisa of a Simon Lubanim, to the greatest time of Jewish history, the Messianic age. But for the Bunim, this is the beginning of the Egyptian servitude. So they are very different experiences. There's the experience of the Bunim who are living in the present, and the experience of Yaakov who is living in the future, so to speak, as the Simon the Bunim. So for Yaakov, these are times of great life. He lived. And for the Bunim, these are days that the Tsara Sashibu, the pain and the trouble of the enslavement, is imminent. Let me just mention one other aspect of this. Now, the Gemara says <coughs> that it's based on the Pascha last week's parsha. It says that when uh, Yaakov was going down to Mitzrayim, he stopped at Be'er Sheva, and God said to him that I will go down with you to Mitzrayim. So the Gemara says, Masech Megillah, the Kol Makom Shagalu Yisroel Shchinei Moim. Wherever the Jews go into exile, the Shechina is with them. The Divine Presence is with them. They went to Mitzrayim, the Shechina is with them. As this verse says, I will go down to Egypt with you. They went to Babel, the Shechina was with them. They went to uh, exile in the time of the Romans, the Shechina was with them. The Maral says that the idea of Shechina Imohem doesn't mean that even in exile, the Shechina excuse me, that, that uh, even in exile the Shechina is with them. It means especially in exile the Shechina is with them. In other words, if you want to know where is the divine concern most manifest, it's when we're in the greatest danger. Because when we're in Eretz Yisrael, living hopefully in security, so the Shechina is less manifest. We, we see to a lesser extent God's concern for us. When we're in Golos, and the natural state of affairs in Golos is that we are threatened, and nevertheless we survive, we manage. That's an even greater sign of the presence of the of the Shina. But to understand that, to appreciate that, requires tremendous insight. In other words, it's like you know, I hate to to, to bring up this muscle, but it always comes up from time to time. You know, if you go to the cheesier gift shops in uh, Niagara Falls or whatever, so you have this uh, poster of the guy walking on the beach with the footsteps, you know? The, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You all know, you all seen it, <laughs> right? So there's, there's uh, along the beach in the sand, there are two parallel sets of footprints, and all of a sudden, at one point, there's only one set of tracks, and uh, the narration goes something like this, that the person felt that he was walking with God, and God was walking beside him, and he was always accompanied, and all of a sudden, he sees in his dream only one set of footprints, and he feels that, oh, God has abandoned him. And God says to him, he says, no. He says, when you see only one set of footprints, that's when I'm carrying you. And that's why there's only one set of footprints. In other words, until then, we're walking side by side. But when there's only one set of footprints, that's when I'm carrying you. Now, there's a lot of truth to that. That's the idea of Kamakim Shagali Yisrael Shechina Imoim, even to a greater extent. In Eretz Yisrael, we're walking side by side with God. It's a very intimate relationship. It says in Golos, Shrina Imoim is the idea that God is carrying us. That's an even closer relationship. It says, but you have to know that because it's easily confused with the sense of abandonment. In other words, the mere fact that we are threatened gives rise to thoughts that maybe God has abandoned us. You know, when Esther went in to plead on behalf of the Jews to Achashverosh, her prayer was, Kaili, Kaili, Loma Zavtani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was her prayer, according to Chazal. There, there was this sense that the mere fact that we were threatened is a sign of abandonment. The truth is, it's the opposite. And the fact that we survived is that God was carrying us. So this is something which is easily confused. At the same time that the Bonim saw the darkness of the imminent servitude, Yaakov Avinu, with his clarity, <coughs> saw Shechini Moim. That was, he saw, in this Egyptian experience, the greatest sign of divine concern and interest. 
And it's something which it takes spiritual insight. Not everybody can understand that. Not everyone understand that. To some people, the, the dangers of Golos, the dangers of Golos, the sorrows of Golos, are indicative of divine abandonment. And in reality, it's the exact opposite. They are indicative of the greatest divine concern. The greatest divine concern. You know, there's a famous Gemara, which maybe can be understood in this light. The, uh, the capital, the Psalm of Tehillim, which corresponds to the Purim story, is uh, the capital that begins, Lam Natseach Ala Yela Sashachar. There's a song that was composed for Yela Sashachar, for the crack of dawn, the morning star, for dawn. And that capital is the capital that has the apostle Keli Keli Lama Azavtani, which was Esther's prayer. But that's the capital, Lam Natseach Ala Yela Sashachar. So they ask the question, Lama Nimshla Esther Ala Yela Sashachar. Why is Esther compared to the crack of dawn? So the Gemara says, because ma ayala sashachar, soifalayla, just like the crack of dawn, is the end of night. So the Purim story is the end of the period of Nisim. Until the story of Esther, the story of Purim, there were miracles, miracles, open miracles, revealed miracles. And then when it came to the Purim story, already things are concealed. In the Purim story, God's hand is not manifest. So that's comparable to the crack of dawn. It's the Saif Hanisim. So the question is pointed out by the Nasivist in this commentary, among others, that the metaphor is reversed. If we're talking about two periods of Jewish history, there's a period of revealed miracles and there's a period of concealment. So we should call the period of miracles day, and the period of concealment we should call night. And therefore we should say that uh, Esther should be uh, like the sunset. Just like the sunset is the end of day, so Esther is the end of the period of miracles. Here the, the metaphor is mangled. Right? We're calling Esther the end of night because the period of miracles is called night, and Esther is the period of, of day. How do you understand that? I mean, there are many attempts to answer this question, but I believe that the correct answer is as follows. In the period of miracles, when is God's concern manifest? When he performs those miracles. So those miracles are like the stars. They are points of light which punctuate the darkness. That's what the Tkufa, the era of miracles, is very much like night. It's dark. The skies are dark. There are points of light. So this miracle is a point of light, and this miracle is a point of light, and this miracle is a point of light. <clears throat> In the time of concealment, it's all the same. It's all the same. There are no two modes. There isn't when there are miracles and when there aren't miracles. In the time of concealment, so to speak, there is just one modality. Now, what is it? So, of course, some people will say that it's like night without the stars. You know, miracles is like night with the stars. And this is like night without the stars. Totally, totally dark. But to a person with genuine spiritual insights, it's the opposite. Says the period where there are no miracles, this is the period where God is carrying us. Right? And therefore, it's really, it's, it's day, it's bright. It's bright. Now, there's a story that's told that a person once came to the Chavetz Chaim and asked the Chavetz Chaim, says, Why don't we witness miracles nowadays? And uh, Chavetz Chaim said, uh, I don't understand the question, can you repeat the question? He says, Why don't we have miracles nowadays? The Chavetz Chaim said, uh, that's what he's asking. Just repeat the question. He says, why are there no miracles nowadays? Says, no, I don't understand. Can, can you explain the question? <laughs> I didn't understand the question. The idea was, <coughs> the Chavaz Chaim didn't deny the fact that, that there were, we don't live in a time where there are supernatural miracles manifest. The point he was making was that if you have the spiritual eyes, you can see there are miracles. And they're easily deniable. But in reality, if you're willing to acknowledge them, it's time of miracles. It says that's the idea that for Yaakov, for Yechi Yaakov, Yaakov was able to live because Yaakov had the eyes to see that even here in Mitzrayim, God was carrying the Jewish people. 
It says, for the children who didn't have that spiritual insight, this was a time of encroaching darkness. But Yaakov was able to see the reality, and every saw this is a time of great light. Now this emerges in a later story in the Parsha. It says that uh, Yaakov gathered his sons, this is to his deathbed, and he says, gather and I will tell you what will happen by Achris Hayomim. I will tell you what happens in the end of days. And it never happens. It never happens. Yaakov never tells them what's going to happen in the end of days. He gives them blessings. <coughs> the blessings do refer to future events, but for the most part, not to the Achris Hayom, not to the end of days. They refer to events over the course of Jewish history. But not to the conclusion of Jewish history, not to the Achris Hayom. So what's going on? So Chazal say, the Bikesh Yaakov Avinu Legalas Asakates. Yaakov wanted to reveal the end. The Nistal Kamimena Shechina. And the Shechina departed from him, didn't give him permission to reveal the Kates. And the Hischoimer Dvarim Achayim. So he began to say other things. He gave them blessings, but he wasn't given permission to reveal the Kates. So the Maral asks the question, but why not? Why wasn't he given permission to reveal the Kates? So the morale says an amazing thing. He says, because the Gzeira of Golos, the decree of Golos, is not just that we suffer the things we suffer. That would be bad enough. But it's much worse than that. It's that we suffer those things without understanding why. That is part of the Gzeira of Golos. That's part of the decree of Golos. That we're not allowed to understand. Now, a human being is very resilient. Human beings can suffer a lot. They can bear a lot of pain. But that's if they understand why. If the suffering is compounded with the not understanding why, that makes it especially painful. Because in addition to not being able to live a, a regular, peaceful, orderly life, we have this question, but why? Why is it happening? Why am I going through this experience? That's what makes it much, much worse. That's part of the decree of Golos. Now, when Yaakov Avinu was going to reveal the case, when Yaakov wanted to reveal the, the end, so we tend to think of things like this, that there is, a, uh, there is a deadline, there is a date which God has in mind by which time he will certainly bring the Mashiach. There's an inevitability to Mashiach coming at that deadline. So we think that Yaakov Bikish Legalas is the case. Yaakov wanted to reveal the end means that what he wanted to reveal was, I'll tell you this date. Is this the date? This is the date, but this time Mashiach is going to come. I think it's more than that. It's not just he was going to reveal the date. He wasn't going to give you just a piece of paper here. This is the date. Mark this date in your calendar. You know, this is when Mashiach is coming. Yaakov wanted to reveal more than that. See, to truly understand this, we have to really understand what the concept of the of the Cates is. What is the concept of the Cates? You know, we've talked about this many times, but it's so important to know. Now, I'll just tell you a funny story. It's like it happened today in Yeshiva. I mentioned it because I just want to illustrate that sometimes where there's a confusion on basic Jewish hashkafa, Jewish thought, you can come to very, very uh, bizarre conclusions. So I was chewing out of class today in Yeshiva. You know, it happens sometimes. You know, you got to give it to them. They, they, you know, messed up their classroom and whatever it was, and I had to give them a talking to. So uh, there was a little damage, uh, nothing major, but whatever. It had to be repaired. So I'm having a discussion on who should pay for the damage, right? So one man, one young man says like this: I think that the Yeshiva should pay for the damage, right? And whoever caused it will get his punishment in the next world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. So I said, and that's not a very solid argument, I'll tell you why. Imagine, imagine, uh, I'm a guy, I'm a poor guy, you know, I'm living from month to month, you know, at the end of the month, I don't have money, you know, waiting for the next paycheck. And someone breaks my window, and it's cold in the house. The cold air is coming in. So I need someone to fix the window, I can't afford to fix the window. So what are you going to say? that the person who broke the window, he'll get his just desserts in the next world. But in the meantime, who's going to solve my problem? Right? 
So the boy says, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. <laughs> so, that, so you must deserve to have it. So he says, yeah. And the reason is you broke my window. That's the reason why it happened. You have to pay for it. Now, it it's very important, you know. We do believe that everything that happens is for the best and so on and so forth. Now, someone else told me a story recently that uh, there was a little boy who broke his mother's very, very precious vase. And the mother is looking down at the boy and says, so what do you have to say for yourself? So the little boy looks up to his mother and says, Gamzu <laughs> You know, these are all valid points, but, you know, you have to put everything in the proper perspective, and you can't invoke these things to, to shirk your, your responsibility. So it's very important. We have to get you know, these Jewish concepts clear. What is the idea of the case? <coughs> There's a deadline by which time Mashiach must come. And the Gemara says that means like this. There are two ways that Mashiach could come. The Gemara brings a Pasuk in Yeshaya. The Pasuk says, Ani Hashem, I am the Lord. Be'ita achishena. In due course, I will hasten the redemption. That's a contradiction. Which is it? Is it Be'ita in due course? Or is it achishena? I will hasten the redemption. So the Gemara says, no contradiction. Zochul, if the Jews merit, achishena. It'll come sooner. It'll be hastened. Lo zochu, if the Jews don't merit, be eaten. It'll come in due course. The Gemara asks another contradiction. That one place it says Mashiach will come, Ba'arul Manonai Shemayin. He'll come down, behold, there's Mashiach. He's coming down from the clouds, miraculously. Another verse says he'll come as an Oni Reichav Alech Amor. He'll come as a poor person riding a donkey. Very natural way. So which is it? The says also, no cashier, no contradiction. Zochu, if the Jews merit, he'll come down from the clouds. Lo zochu, if they don't merit, he'll come as an ani reich of Allah, Hamur. So we assume it means if the Jews merit, then it will be miracles. If they don't merit, it will be very natural. We want to explain the pshat like this, different. Gu'ula, redemption, is not an event. Redemption is a process. And the process of redemption is unfolding on an ongoing basis from the very beginning, from the very beginning of Golos, the process of redemption is unfolding. It takes time for it to unfold. Many aspects of it we have already witnessed in our time. <coughs> for example, if one of the aspects of redemption is kibbutz Golias and gathering of the exiles, we've seen much of that happen already. You think about what Eretz Yisrael was like a hundred years ago. And what it's like today, there's no comparison. A hundred years ago, there was a very small fraction of the Jewish people living in Eretz Israel. Today, we've reached a point where I think it's safe to say that almost 50% of Jews are there. And it's increasing. And the Jews have come from many, many, many countries. The Arab countries, that was just shortly after the establishment of the state, the Arab countries forced their inhabitants to leave Syria, Iraq, Egypt, etc. The Soviet Union, we saw the massive uh, influx of Russian Jews that's closer to our time. The last holdouts are the Jews of North America, but our time is also going to come. The whole will be gathered. So we see the kibbutz Goliath, it, it's, it's beginning. We see that the Jews have a state, a, a government, a certain level of autonomy. It's not perfect. Right? We still are dependent on other nations. There are political considerations and so on and so forth, but a level of autonomy which we haven't enjoyed for many, many hundreds of years. Now, the Gemara in Sanhedrin says that the agricultural bounty of Eretz Israel is a sign of the imminent coming of Mashiach. It says, Vatem Hari Yisrael, the Navi calls out to the mountains of Israel, Anachem Titnu, Prichem Tisu, give forth your branches and bear your fruit, Lama Yisrael, Kikar Bulava, for my Jewish nation, which is soon to come. The Gemara says, Eim Loch Alkeitim Gulam This is the surest sign of the imminent coming of Mashiach. And we know this is a fact that for hundreds of years, no one could coax anything out of the, the ground of Eretz Yisrael until the Yidlach came back, and all of a sudden, with the irrigation and the technology, it's become a bountiful land. That's also a sign of the coming of Mashiach. I joke all the time 
that the most important invention before the coming of Mashiach is plastic. But everything is made of plastic, this is why. Because in the Muslim Mashiach, all the laws of Tuma and Tara will apply. So uh, what would happen? Uh, we'd be running to the mikvah all the time to immerse all the vessels, all the kalim, everything. Everything has become tummy. How could we live? Once upon a time, what did people own? They owned one bowl, a couple of spoons, and that was it. Right? Nowadays, think about it. Think about uh, how many forks does the average house own? How many spoons and how many knives and how many plates and how many glasses? I mean, hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, objects. <coughs> We have to immerse them in the mikvah all the time, getting tummy tar. So the answer is, in Moshiach's time, everything will be plastic. Plastic doesn't become tummy. It's not a natural material. So uh, we're on the verge. Everything is plastic. I think my car is made of plastic. <laughs> Almost. Well, it used to be cars I thought were made of steel or something. I don't know. It seems now the whole body is plastic. It's incredible. In any case, so that's also part of Moshiach Mashiach coming. I'll tell you a story, just to illustrate. I might keep you a little late, but, you know. That's okay. No one has to go to any holiday celebrations tonight, so. <laughs> <laughs> they tell a story. They tell a story about, about uh, the, the Pana Vizharov. I, I say it often, but it's a beautiful story. The Pana Vizharov, was the, he was the Rav in Lithuania of a town called Pana Viz. And there was a shul in Pana Viz which did not have a floor. It was a dirt floor. And they wanted to raise money to build a floor in this shul. So, so they asked him, he was the rub of the city, he should make the appeal to raise the money to build the floor. Okay, so he comes to the shul, and he says the following to us. He says, you know, Mashiach is going to come. How are the Jews going to get to, to Eretz Yisrael? <coughs> Mashiach's time is not going to travel. How are they going to travel? The answer is like this. The Gemara says, in Mesechus Megillah, that all the synagogues of the, the exile will be uprooted from their places and will be put in Eretz Israel. So that's the answer. All the Jews will gather in their shuls, and the shul will be torn out of the ground and transported with the Jews in it to Eretz Israel. But that's only if the shul has a floor, right? <laughs> if the shul doesn't have a floor, so the building will be uprooted, the Jews will be left standing there on the ground, and that will be it. That's why the shul has to have a floor. That was his drush. But, but we know the answer to the question. It it says, they got a floor. They got a floor. But, but what's the real answer to the question? How do the Jews are going to get there to Israel? Well, says that's what the jet airplane was invented for. Yeah. Right? If you remember, when the Jews were coming out of the Soviet Union, there was one point at which there were flights, flight after flight, minutes apart, were landing and la or the Ethiopian Jews, landing, landing, landing. Now, listen to this. The first thing Yeshaya says when it refers to the Jews returning to Israel, he says, Mi Eila Ka'ov to Ufena. Who are these who fly like clouds? Uchayonim El Arugosehim, like doves to their nests. That's what the verse says. And we're talking about the ingathering of the exiles, says, Who are they? Fly like the clouds, like doves to their nests. And this is one of those prophecies that it's hard to imagine. What did they think it meant? For the hundreds and hundreds of years before the invention of the jet airplane, before we had these white gleaming jets, what did they think these prophecies meant? I don't know. It says, but we know what they meant. That's exactly what it looks like. As you see these white birds coming and landing and landing and landing and landing and discharging their, their occupants, that's what the Navi was talking about. Right? So, so obviously, the Wright brothers also have a share. <laughs> but if it wasn't for them, then we wouldn't have the jet airplane. We wouldn't have any airplane. So the point is, it's a process. It's a process. And everything is unfolding, 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 unfolding. How long does it take this process to unfold? From the beginning of Golos until the case. That's the amount of time it takes to unfold naturally. So if the Jews are not unusually deserving, there is an inevitability, but that inevitability to redemption is when the case comes. By that time, we will have had time for the process to unfold naturally, and that's when it will come. And that's the idea of lo zochu, if the Jews don't merit, it'll be it'll be ita in due course at the case, and then it'll be a totally natural process, ani reichem v'lachamor, pumen riding a donkey. 
because there will have been enough time for the process to unfold naturally. And by the way, and that is the basis of our hope, that even though Mashiach didn't come for the great generations beforehand, Mashiach can come for us, because we say he didn't come before the great generations before. Because at that point, there was so much more of the groundwork that had to be laid. By right now, so much more of the groundwork was laid. It would be easier to bring Mashiach. But if the Jews merit, then Mashiach can come prematurely. Now the question is, but there won't have been time for the process to be, to unfold naturally. So how can Mashiach come early? The answer is then it be miraculous. Right? It says because there, there wasn't enough time. So how do you compress, you know, months and perhaps years of preparation into a shorter period of time? Mashiach come early. Then there'll be miracles. They'll come down from the clouds. Those are the two possibilities. Isn't there a, a direct corollary between the advancement and the laying of the groundwork and the reduction of merit of the people. As I'm saying, that's exactly the point. In other words, in other words, for Mashiach to have come 200 years ago would have required much more merit. Why? Because there was so much of the natural groundwork was not yet laid, so you need greater merit to complete the process. It says now that so much of the process has unfolded naturally, the little bit that's left, we can even bring with our meager merit. That's the answer to the question. That's why, even though Mashiach didn't come for the great Sadiqim of 200 years ago, it's very possible it'll come for us even prematurely. Because there's so much less that has to be done. But in any case, in any case, when Yaakov wanted to reel the case, he wasn't just going to give the date. He was going to explain the entire unfolding of Jewish history. He was going to explain exactly why everything has to happen the way it happens and how it's going to happen and how it's going to lead to the ultimate case. It's not just a date, not just, again, save this date in your calendar. It was going to reveal the entire course of Jewish history. What would the advantage have been? Imagine if you're going to be told when the case is. Now, you know, in hindsight, now we know that it, it, it was quite delayed. We're talking about, you know, over 3,000 years from Yaakov's time. And it hasn't happened yet. <coughs> so what benefit would there have been? Why would Yaakov want to reveal that? What consolation would that have been? The answer is very simple. Because if Yaakov could explain not just that it is going to happen 3,000 years from now, but why it's going to happen and why everything is going to happen over those 3,000 years, it would be so much easier to live through it. Because it's not that Gullus is comfortable, but at least we'd have the understanding of it says, Yaakov wasn't given the permission to reveal that. says the Maral, because that was the Gzeir of Golos. That's the decree of Golos. The decree of Golos is not just to live through this, the discomfort of Golos, but it's also to live without the understanding of why. That's why Yaakov couldn't reveal it. But Yaakov himself knew it. It was taken away from him that he shouldn't reveal it. But until that point, Yaakov knew it. It says the person who knows that, his life is totally different. Well, I, I give you a muscle. You know, sometimes you read about the shidduch crisis. You know, you have girls that want to get married, and uh, you know they're meeting boys, and uh, 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 nothing works, and they may be getting a little bit older, and uh, they're very upset. Let's say you, you, you met one of these girls. She's uh, she feels she's an old maid. She's old of 21. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, you tell her, listen, says, I'm a novi. I'm telling you, says, you're going to, you're not going to get married until you're 25. But I promise you that when you meet that boy on your 25th birthday, you will know immediately he's the one, and you'll immediately understand that he was worth waiting for. Says, what will that do to the girl's life? Well, transform her life. Now she's free. She can study and she can work and she can have experiences and she can enjoy life. Because she doesn't have to worry, you know, I have to try this and try this and maybe this is the one, maybe this is the one, maybe this I know what's going to happen when I'm 25. And I have four years to relax. And she can uh, take up hobbies and she can travel and she can do all sorts of wonderful things. But because she doesn't know, 
So she's spending uh, weekends flying to New York meeting uh, boys, <laughs> which is a drag. So that's the point. If you could only know how your life and how history is meant to unfold, your life would be different. Says, that was the decree that you should not know. That's why it was concealed. But Yaakov didn't know. At the same time that everyone else only saw misery, Yaakov saw light. Because he had an understanding. Right? That is why it was Vayechi Yaakov. For Yaakov, these were years of, of light and joy. Whereas for the sons who didn't know what Yaakov knew, these were lights of night, these were times of darkness. <coughs> but I would like to think that we could achieve, if not the total illumination, a certain measure of that light with faith, with the moon. In other words, not through knowledge, we obviously don't know what the purpose is, but if we understand that everything that God does is for good, again, I don't mean to exempt ourselves of responsibility. I don't like a little boy who breaks the vase and says, <laughs> right? No, we have to take personal responsibility for what we do. That's true. But what God does, we have to recognize that is for the best. And that illumination that we don't have through our exact knowledge of how and why it's for the best, through amuna, through faith, we can have a little bit of that glimmer of that light. And therefore the darkness of our own situation, whether it's the national situation of Golos, or whether it's our own personal situation, or every person in his own life has uh, areas of worry and concern. But through, through Imuna, through faith, it can become better. Now, I'll share with you a trivial story that happened to our family this past week. And you know, it, it's really trivial, right? But you know, we have a house, we're actually renting the house, and the house had two water heaters in the house. Good, big house, big family, need a lot of hot water. The two water heaters. Then one gave out. One gave out and didn't, didn't want, the landlord didn't want to replace it. One water heater is enough, right? Is it really enough? It's barely enough, you know, with the family, you know. So uh, we're managing, managing. The last people on Friday <laughs> to use the shower, it's a little, a little cool. Okay, then Thursday morning, all of a sudden, my wife says, the hot water isn't working, there's a leak in the basement. That means the other water heater oh has given out. So now we're, we're facing imminent <laughs> problems. So we call the landlord and said, okay, and now they have to replace it. So they replace it with a mammoth 75-gallon water heater, <laughs> right, which was just as big as the old two put together. Brand new, it works. More efficient. You know, but more efficient, saves money on the, on the gas. Now there's more hot water than anybody could, yeah. could dream of. And Baruch Hashem was installed just before Shabbos <coughs> on, on Friday. Very, very fast. Because they said the urgency, you know, it's Thursday, it has to be fixed for Shabbos. So, so we got the hot water. So I said to myself, you know, Friday morning, we saw that leak on the floor. We said, oh, this is it. We're, we're finished, <laughs> right? And then just a short while later, ah, hot water. That's trivial, right? But the point is this, that, that life is always like that. For a moment, it seems very, very bleak. Right? Everything is falling apart. Everything is collapsing. And then often in a very, very short time, Redemption. I don't, I don't want to equate getting hot water heaters with Shiaf. Not quite the same thing. But you know, you know what I mean. In, in, in life, there's so many things that are like but that. But the lack of this can be like us. Yeah, go ahead. There's so many things like that. that, that in life, that, that you know, you know, a person loses a job, and and you're wondering, oh, what's going to be now? I've lost the job. I, I've quit the job. You know, there's a moment of uncertainty. And then all of a sudden, a short time afterward you see that it's far beyond what I could have dreamt. And then we understand why we have to go through this experience. We have to go through this momentary negative experience to clear the 
decks for the next positive experience. As long as you have that old job, you can't go into the new job. And there's sort of thing like that. So there's a moment of discomfort. But it has to be that way. It has to be that way, because otherwise, how are you going to progress? How are you going to make changes unless the old thing finally gives out? So <coughs> that light that Yaakov Avinu had with perfect clarity, because Yaakov Avinu knew, says that we can't achieve. That's part of the Xavier of Gaulus. But with faith, we can overcome that, and we can have at least a glimmer of that light. Everyone have a great weekend, and next week we will meet again.